Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is Videocast 117, Podcast Episode 107 for the week ending January 14th, 2022. Uh, great to be on with everyone. We've got a lot of great stuff to cover, and a new theme that we're going to be going into this week that I think you'll find very interesting. We hinted at it in uh, a couple of our December podcasts, but we really pounced on it this week. So uh, so we'll be letting you know about that. Um, want to uh, first we'll do a quick media spots. Want to thank Liz Clayman and Ellie Terrett for having me on Fox Business The Clayman Countdown last Friday. Uh, we're going to go into this appearance uh, in more detail in the article of the week. Uh, so just wanted to thank them. And then I want to thank uh, Ellie Terrett and Lauren Simonetti for having me on Fox Business today on The Clayman Countdown. And in this segment, uh, we were talking about retail sales. I was on with Phil Flynn, who always has the best insight on oil, by the way. Uh, you should consider signing up for his oil uh, newsletter. Uh, it's free. I think you can do it at the price group um, or just f follow him on Twitter at Phil Flynn. I think you'll find that really helpful. Uh, anyway, the, the question was about retail sales down 1.9%, X-Auto down 2.3%, uh, both missing estimates. I think the real number was consumer sentiment was very weak, 68.8 uh, versus 70. And uh, the, the groups that took the biggest hit in December were online retailers at negative 8.7% uh, and home furnishings at negative 5.5%. Now, these are short-term headwinds in our view. Uh, and were caused for three reasons. First off, you had Omicron in December, so that hit hit the retail confidence. Uh, second, you had the inflation numbers, the CPI print at 7%, uh, which was the highest since 1982, and the PPI wholesale prices were up 9.7%, highest since 2010. And, you know, you have to think about this in a context of what happened during the pandemic. Demand shift dramatically from services pre-pandemic to goods pandemic. So uh, you had this huge demand in goods over services, which created, in a sense, the supply chain issues. You also had factory shutdowns in Asia, which exacerbated it. Um, and then you had unle unprecedented levels of cash injections to the economy from both fiscal and monetary policy. And then the third factor that led to these uh, inflation number, uh, these uh, retail numbers is you had a monster pull forward of demand and purchasing for the holidays um, in October and November because there was large fears over not being able to get goods in time for Christmas. So a lot of that was pulled forward. That's That had an impact on the numbers for, for December. Now, the big picture uh, still is the consumer's balance sheet has never been in better shape. Uh, consumers have $2 trillion in cash balances. They're still spending 25% more than pre-pandemic. Their net worth has grown from uh, both real estate and uh, stock and retirement holdings. They've been paying down debt. The debt service ratio for households is now the lowest in 50 years of recorded history. It may be the lowest of all time. We don't have data before that. Uh, and plenty of jobs available. So as Omicron rolls over, uh, as we've seen in South Africa and now in the United Kingdom, we expect spending to shift back to services, i.e. travel and leisure, from goods that should alleviate some of the price pressure and supply chain issues, which I think will be go a long way to bring some of those inflation numbers down. Probably not in time for March uh, to to uh, slow the Fed down. They they seem to be intent to move quickly, uh, but um, certainly may may slow down the trajectory of hikes and quantitative tightening uh, towards the back half of the year, which would be uh, constructive. And uh, one group that we spoke about with Lauren was uh, that's been tremendously unloved that we've been building position for the last couple of months. Um, is the casinos, okay? And particularly uh, the casinos that have exposure to Macau because they they had been under tremendous weight since September when the government uh, kind of looked into them and it wasn't clear whether they were going to get their licenses renewed, renewed. Our view was that they would because they've invested tens of billions of dollars in the local economy and, they, and the Chinese government wouldn't screw the local partners. And that's exactly what happened today. 
Um, they said that the licenses will, you know, will remain for the six who have them, which basically means they gave uh, effectively a six person or six group oligopoly. Uh, and they will last for 10 years versus 20 years with a three year extension. So they were all up double digits today. And what I shared with Lauren was, uh, yeah, they're up double digits and that's great. Um, but they're still down 37% from their 52 week highs. We think there's a lot more runway in those stocks and they will work their way up to new highs over the next year, uh, if not sooner. So uh, we think that's a huge opportunity and plenty of room to run. So uh, thanks again to Lauren and Ellie Terrett for having me on that. Want to thank uh, Bansari Kamdar and Sriyashi Senyal for including me in their Reuters article er earlier in the week. Uh, I was one morning, the market was down. I said fears about the Fed is key this morning as it was certainly last week. Uh, and you have Goldman now expecting to see four rate hikes in 2022. And that's just a very hostile environment for tech and growth stocks, said Thomas Hayes. Uh, and we, we've seen that borne out. So um, let's start off with the quote of the day. Even the intelligent investor needs considerable willpower to keep from following the crowd. Um, today, uh, uh, well, we'll get into that in just a little bit, but um, um, here is uh, an interesting chart from Kimball Charting. He says, here's why value stocks may shine in 2022. And basically, this is um, growth to value. And you could see here, it's kind of making a double top. We'll see if this persists, um, you know, when parabolic before the uh, pandemic in 2019, and, and then last year, early in the year, value had a monster, monster move, which is what led to uh, financials and energy being the top two, top couple of performers last year. Um, then it reversed towards the end of the year, and now it seems to be moving back in phase. And we've covered this, just the inverse. We've shown the chart that looks more like that, but I thought that was an interesting thing to show. Quick uh, things on Alibaba. We don't have to talk a lot about it this week because it's up, uh, it had a 24% move in two weeks. So it's starting to starting to move now and uh, sentiment is starting to change, which is very, very constructive. Uh, but I think the bigger thing, if you recall a month or so ago, we talked about uh, Jack Ma was in Europe uh, on a horticultural trip trying to find ways to grow food for the Chinese people working on behalf of the Chinese government. So he's fallen into line. The Chinese government seems to have uh, backed off then on, on China. He's eaten, you know, fallen on his sword, eaten some humble pie and is working with the government. Uh, he also showed up this week in... Uh, Hainan Primary School in China, which is a very rare Chinese appearance for him to celebrate the seventh anniversary of the, his royal teacher's charity. Um, so it looks like uh, he's slowly coming back out. The government is uh, allowing him back out. He's paid his penance. Uh, and uh, that's a good thing for Alibaba uh, because the government will take the, effectively take the target off of its back. And uh, so long as they fall in line with the new regulations that have been laid out over the last four or five, six months, uh, they should be able to continue to grow uh, uh, nicely moving forward. Uh, Jack Denton put out a couple articles on Alibaba over at Barron's this week. Alibaba stock is on a tear. Here are five reasons investors are buying the dip. We've covered all these ad infinitum uh, over the last uh, few weeks, so uh, we will not spend a lot of time on that. But I think the other important thing to note is that the Chinese government is limited. They, I think they've come to the conclusion that the crackdowns, albeit in their view, were necessary. Um, uh, the implications, uh, they got right up to the edge of the cliff before uh, started pulling back uh, in the last month or so with both monetary and fiscal uh, accommodation as well as uh, ease, easing up on the regulation and starting to clarify rules, which has enabled the stocks to, to bottom and start to rebound. The other key factor I think that that is playing a role is uh, Chinese education group New Oriental fires 60,000 workers. That's just one company. So that rash decision they made over the summer with these uh, education stocks, which by the way, not only tutor children, but they also teach people English, how to speak English. Um, uh, so if you think about the whole education sector, I think it's probably a quarter million people out of work. Uh, and I think that uh, the continued crackdowns would have led to millions out of work. And that's the formula for social unrest, which is not in their interest. 
uh, particularly going into the China National Congress next November, which is the transition meeting. Uh, and it's just a reminder that uh, actions have consequences and uh, they went right up to the brink before pulling back. And, uh, and now the stocks are seeing some, some bottoming. This is Alibaba the first couple of weeks of the year, up 24% consolidating a little bit here, but uh, looks very healthy moving forward. Uh, Intel, this is one of these value stocks we talked about last year. Uh, got a new CFO from Micron. Uh, stock is moving up on that, um, as well as the climate is looking for more um, stocks that are earning money versus stocks that are promising to earn money, and Intel falls in that bucket. And we've seen a monster, monster beginning of the year. I've never, uh, well, no, I have seen something like it. Last year's beginning of the year was unbelievable as well. Uh, but it's been an exciting couple of weeks here um, to see everything of value just start to move up all at once is, is just beautiful. So um, speaking of value, you know, the, the, there is this kind of consensus that uh, we're at a top and we're going to crash. Um and, you know, we're, um, we mentioned in the last week that, um, you know, we could certainly see, you know, the 3 to 5% corrections of last year would turn into 8 to 10%, and we would be raising some cash into the Fed meeting on um, January 25th and 26th. Um, we, it's interesting, every time we look for, what's to short uh, and what's to go long, there are still really tremendous opportunities to go long. And there are some shorts available, but nothing like super high high conviction here. So um, it's good to have cash, but I think what that's telling us is dispersion is high and it's a stock picker's market. I mean, you know, I've talked to some people that are having a really tough week, a couple of weeks, and we're just having an unbelievable positive two weeks. Um, and I think it just goes down to what, you know, what groups you're in. And we're going to talk about a new group that we really leaned into today and in the last couple of days that we think is going to be a winner uh, moving forward. But, um, you know, you can look Goldman Sachs, but I, I want to go through three lists of cheap stocks because it goes to show you how much opportunity is still out there. Um, if you're selective and if you know what you're doing and, and if you're doing fundamental research. So uh, Goldman Sachs says, buy these 15 stocks for market beating returns of at least 40% in 2022, far above the 7% return the S&P 500 is likely to deliver. And I looked through their picks and they're good. I mean, UAL, I like that. Uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines, I like that. I was just on today talking about travel and leisure. Boeing, I love this. Uh, and this has had a huge move we're going to talk about uh, in just a bit. Hess, Fine, Energy, Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Uh, this is, is an interesting stock, but it's the sector I want to talk about more than anything else. Uh, Alaska Air we like, we own, uh, Salesforce, uh, maybe, uh, mixed, mixed bag on that. I'm going to, I'm going to pass on that one. Activision Blizzard we like, Solar Edge, uh, no view, Enphase, no view, Las Vegas Sands we love. Uh, we, we, uh, love this thing long term. We think it's going to work its way to new highs in the next 12 to 24 months. And today was the huge catalyst, which we covered on uh, um, uh, the claim and countdown with uh, Lauren Simonetti today. Um, and that's up double digits. So um, Moderna, no thank you. Uh, Insight is a biotech. We're gonna talk about that group. Viacon CBS is starting to move. Penn National, mm, no view there. Um, okay, this was an article from Barbara Colmayer, uh, same type of thing. What was the subject? Dozens of cheap stocks that could be poised to outperform as the U.S. starts to rise, raise rates. So you'll see it's a lot of oil and gas. Um, some of these have already moved quite a bit. Banks, she likes City. Okay, so now they like City. Now they like oil and now they like energy and banks a year and a half after the bottom. Uh, but there are still some cheap ones, so it's not 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 terrible picks. Uh, some insurance companies, okay, they've, they've moved already. Uh, chemicals, I think there's some opportunity there. Um, Cigna, we own, that's had a monster move in the last couple of weeks. I think it's now up to 240. Let's take a look at Cigna. C-I. 
So everything's just moving all at once. So yeah, Cigna's up from 213 in December to 242 as of today. We said that we think that's going to work its way higher to 270 plus, uh, and it's starting to do that. That's that's still a cheap stock. Um, where is okay? She's also got PCG. That's a special situation. That's a utility in California. Uh, we like that call. It's, it's going to take a couple of years, but that could work up to uh, it could be a tremendous stock moving forward. And then all of these media companies we've been talking about: Viacom, Fox, Discovery. Uh, Altice, I, I like these four. I like I like all four of them. Uh, these others, I no no view. Uh, Gen General Motors, I, I, I'll, not not for me. Um, and that's that. And then finally, uh, 33 undervalued stocks for 2022 from uh, Susan Dusbinski. She puts out a lot of good articles on Morningstar. Um, let's see. So that was basic materials. On, pass on that. Uh, communication services sector, she puts uh, AT&T and Viacom. Pinterest, I have no view, but uh, AT&T and Viacom, I like. AT&T, uh, UBS had an upgrade, said the expects the Warner Media sale to be completed in Q2, uh, seen as catalyst for shares paving the way for buybacks in 2023. And, um, and that stock is, has started to move up. I think one of the Ask Me Anything questions a couple weeks ago was on that stock and, uh, and that's starting to work. Um, uh, Nordstrom, I think is kind of interesting. She has here Boston beer. This one's, this one's tricky. I actually had uh, one of these young guys send me this idea. Um, it's interesting. They, they said the truly is just, uh, today. I think they came out and saying the truly is going to continue to be terrible, but that's, that's one probably worth looking at a little more closely beyond meat. She puts here, I, you know, I, I wouldn't eat that with your, mouth i mean but uh i guess some people like it um i i have to look i think it's still too expensive you know some of these stocks that go from trading at 80 times sales with no earnings to, to 40 times sales with no earnings people say are a bargain but um you really have to prove out the growth story and so far every single fast food place they put it in uh it just seems to fail and they pull it out now kentucky fried chicken's going to give it a try i mean I don't know. You want vegetable chick fried chicken wings? I mean, that that it's like how unhealthy can you get? It's like it's like, you know, fried Oreos. It's like can you can you do any worse? But nonetheless, um <laughs> uh it's it's crazy. All right. Um Exxon a little late. Schlumberger is still interesting. Uh Citigroup is still fine. I mean, e even today with the earnings, we'll talk about bank earnings were mixed. Wells Fargo was the winner up big um and then healthcare they've got biomarin i think that's interesting merck we talked about a few weeks ago zimmer biomet i can't remember it off the top of my head but i think that's kind of interesting and then industrials ge love it um uh delta airlines all the airlines I'm, i think are interesting um and then real estate pass uh reads rather uh technology she also has salesforce pass i mean agnostic uh vmware i have to look at that one i think that came up on one of my views and she has some uh utilities eh. all right those have already moved so uh the big thing this week was the fed and i said it with lauren today that um part of the volatility is is just the fed can't get their message straight you know they they just keep putting out speakers one says four hikes, one says five hikes, one says uh, um, quantitative tightening. Immediately, they said in the Fed minutes, uh, as soon as they start to raise rates, which would imply March quantitative tightening, which would just be crazy to do all three at once. Uh, and then Powell was out talking about benevolent interest rate hikes, saying that we need to cool inflation in order to get to full employment uh, because wages are going up too quickly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think, you know, I think the net effect is that they're going to hike in March, uh, unless the inflation numbers come down hard before then, which I don't think they will. I think they'll start to moderate, but not enough for them to stop. Um, there was a guy on Harkin from, uh, Pennsylvania, I, I think Pennsylvania. Anyway, he was on last night and he said something that made the most sense, which was <clears throat> the 
policy rate is the most important tool that they have. And he would would foresee four hikes prior to starting quantitative tightening. So rather than, you know, taking 18 months from uh, hiking to start rolling off the balance sheet, that would be more in line with, you know, he was thinking three to four hikes for 2022. So I think I think two to four hikes is is reasonable. I wouldn't be surprised by two, which is not consensus. Everyone thinks it's going to be four or five now. And I also wouldn't be terribly surprised by four, which which probably implies uh, be three. And um, and I like the idea of not messing with quantitative tightening until you're up towards one percent on the Fed funds rate. See how the market digests. The problem is, is all these actions have a lagged effect. So they're going to say, oh, that, you know, we raised three times. The, the economy hasn't slowed yet. But the problem is, is the impact is felt six to nine months later. So they'll be like all clear. They start tapering too hard, which they he did imply they would go at a faster pace than they did in 2018. 2018, they inverted the yield curve in less than two years. We got a recession six months after. Uh, this time, it looks like they want to rush and invert the curve in one year after they start tapering. Uh, in which case, more likely we have a recession. That would be 2024, 2025. But um, we'll we'll see how they come out and what happens with the inflation prints. But we, we kind of covered that today on why we think some of this is uh, temporary as uh, demand shifts into services versus goods. So, uh, so that was that. Uh, Susquehanna upgraded all the airlines this week. Now, this is the new theme that I want to talk. If you remember last month, on one of the podcast video casts, I said that uh, go through a bunch of biotech stocks, uh, like 75% of them look like they're in a depression. And I and I mentioned that just in passing on one of the podcast video casts in mid-December. And this week we got very, very aggressive about it. Uh, it's now uh, just over, uh, just about a 5% position in the portfolio exposure to biotech. Uh, that's in actual dollars. Notional, it'll have a much bigger impact, outsized uh, impact, because there's some embedded uh, leverage and de- derivatives in, in the positioning uh, so that uh, as these bottom out uh, and reverse, we can really get some meaningful upside. Now, Ben Levinson wrote an interesting article on January 9th. He said that... Um, uh, he's pitching Vertex, which is fine. I'm, I'm, I'm agnostic on that. I think that's, that's, that'll work fine. But um, he says the sector had a terrible 2021. The iShares uh, ETF IBB, which weights its holdings by market capitalization, <coughs> rose 1%, its worst year since 2018, while the equal weighted uh, biotech ETF XBI fell 25%, its worst year since at least 20. Uh, since 2007. This year was supposed to be better, but so far it's been anything but with the iShares ETF down 7.9% through Friday's close. That was last week. This week it fell further, which is why we stepped in heavily handed, heavy handed in the last uh, couple of days, including today, um, through Friday's close and the S Spider ETF off 8% for their worst starts to a year since 2016. Music to my ears. Go back to Ben Graham. Even the intelligent investor is likely to need considerable willpower to keep from following the crowd. By the way, this was, if you remember, um, for those of you who've been with us for some time, even the best of the best. So our basis for Wells Fargo was 2501. And if you remember, we started buying around 28, bought, bought all the way down into the 2022s, 20, 22 and change. Um, there was an article on Barron's today basically showing that Berkshire sold out of their whole position during the crisis at around $26. Um, if you recall, they got rid of all the banks. And I think that is, uh, okay, it's off the front page. It was on the front page this afternoon. And I think that was attributable to Todd and Ted, not not necessarily Warren. But um, I remember when we were doing the podcast, I was like, there's some 
elephant in here and it the selling just keeps going and going and going and we were buying and buying and buying and it turns out we were buying from Todd and Ted uh, because they were selling it looks like got out at twenty six dollars we got in around twenty five oh one um, so now they had great earnings uh, today and a huge run in the new year up probably over 20 percent now in the last couple of weeks we started shaving that position uh, and we have reallocated some of those profits. Uh, we still have a meaningful position in Wells Fargo, but we started taking profits. I, I do think this stock can, can get up to uh, certainly $75 and probably $100, but it's going to be over the next few years and it's going to be bumpier than it. You know, we basically had a straight up ride for the first 12 months. Um, I think the next catalyst is going to be when they lift the asset cap. We'll probably take off another slug at that point. Uh, and then we'll probably hold a decent amount for the long term. I'd like to see a hundred handle. I, I'm not sure if we'll get there this cycle, but I think we could based on millennial housing demand and their sensitivity to rates. The reason they were positive while all the other banks were negative today is partially because they're the most uh, sensitive to they do the best when rates go up. Uh, so we do want to hold some, but we are taking that uh, profits and, and we reallocated some of those profits into biotech uh, today, yesterday, the last couple of days, we think uh, the upside is meaningful. So, you know, even if Wells Fargo can get to 90 or 100 over the next uh, one to three years, uh, we think some of these biotech stocks can uh, uh, be up 100, 200 percent. So um, so that's that's what we're doing there. And um, a pretty exciting week. So Getting back to Ben's article here in uh, biotech. Okay, so worst year since 2007. This year was supposed to be better. Okay, so far it's down. Blame it on the hawkish minutes from the Fed's December meeting. Eh, I don't think I don't think that's fully attributable to that. But uh, nonetheless, still there are reasons to believe that things could get better. For starters, biotech stocks almost never have had two bad years in a row. The last shall be first. That's the title of this article, guys. Uh, this week and guys and girls and um and that that's absolutely correct um and the fund uh so let's see the last time the spider etf suffered a drop of 15 percent or more was in 2018 and the fund followed it up with a 33 percent increase in 2019 which means many of the stocks were up 50 percent 100 percent plus um it dropped more than 15 percent in 2016 and followed that up with a 44 percent rise in 2017 uh I, I think this sets up very very similarly uh, the sell-off has left more than 70 companies with more cash than their combined equity and debt, observes Baird analyst Brian Scorney, uh, the most he has ever seen. With the excitement of someone catching a falling knife, our view is turning optimistic on biotech outperformance going forward, he writes, acknowledging structural risks remain. We think the sector is now well into oversold territory and believe we will see strong relative performance in 2022. We couldn't agree more. Um, okay, so then they just pitch a couple of names, uh, which, which, which is less important here. The key is the theme. Uh, the other thing where we got excited was this week, uh, Biogen, um, so Medicare refused to cover Biogen's Alzheimer's drug except for trials. Biogen is now saying that they're going to fight Medicare over their Alzheimer's drug limits um, and probably a fight means lobby and uh, pay people to fight uh, to communicate their message better. Uh, whether that gets approved or not, that is a big weighting. So that would matter. Uh, did, the data could get better. But our, our theme thesis is not predicated on whether Biogen gets their drug through or not. Uh, we think there's a lot more going on. Also, as the Omicron cases um, roll over like we saw, like we're seeing in other countries around the world, those hospital beds are going to be filled up with procedures and, and all these drug companies are going to start uh, doing exceptionally well. The doctor visits will come back and sadly a lot of people are, that have missed their regular visits are going to find that they have other stuff to deal with besides uh, Omicron. Um, so, uh, so the drug usage will go up and the scripts will go up and uh, this, this group is going to be a big, big beneficiary. Uh, this is the, uh, basically just put all of the components of the IBB uh, biotech ETF into chart form, just so you could see that most of these are, are looking oversold. Now you have to drill down one by one and look at the fundamentals. But if you just look, 
and you think, oh, the market's in a bubble. Well, does this stock look like it's in a bubble? Does this stock look like it's in a bubble? Does this stock look like it's in a bubble? No, these are more oversold that look kind of interesting that, that may be bottoming. I mean, they're just one after another. And this is what I was talking about in December when I said that a lot of these stocks look like they're in a depression. An opportunity is going to be coming up. And this week was that opportunity in our view. And if it goes lower, like always, like Boeing, like, uh, like yeah, like Boeing, like uh, Wells Fargo, like uh, Baba, if it goes against us, we'll just buy more. I mean, and, and uh, until it bottoms and then it'll turn around and double and beyond. So, um, but we'll just go through a few pages. Does this look like the market's in a bubble? Does this look like the market's in a bubble? By the way, we did this on September 16th. We, we gave you a page of stocks. They're all, I'd say 80% of them have just rocketed up, whether it's Cigna or um, Boeing starting to move, Lockheed Martin, uh, Dollar Tree was on that list. Um, so, you know, I'm going through it with you now. We'll see in six months. We go through the same list, IBB, and you, you're going to just see a lot of these stocks that are oversold and bottoming. Um, you know, there are a few that are moving, but by and large, there's more opportunity than there is difficulty in, in, in our view because of the difficulty. They're all, they've all just been sold to death. And uh, that's where we get very, very interested. And there aren't many groups in the world, never mind in the U.S., where you can find that type of opportunity. The only place we find this type of opportunity uh, besides biotech has been China stocks that have gotten beaten down this much. And, uh, and now they're starting to rebound. So we got to find a new theme to add, to add and to uh, take profits from groups that we bought when they looked like this, like banks and energy, start to peel off some profits and put them into these that will be the next batch of winners. Look at this. I mean, it's just literally depression-like. And these are all components of that ETF that Ben was referring to. There's what biotech looks like from 468 down to 240. I mean, these things look like death. These, this is not some mom and pop company. This thing's going to come back with the Alzheimer's drug or without it, whether they have to lower the price. What, they'll figure it out. You know, they, these, <laughs> these guys... They figure it out, trust me, or or they find another job and, and the next guy figures it out. And while you wait for the next uh, girl or guy CEO to figure it out, the stock usually gives them the benefit of the doubt. Here's Biomarine they were talking about. I think this is quite a gap to fill. I mean, th this is just heaven looking at these. Uh, and then you drill down on a name-by-name -name basis or you just buy the whole basket uh, and, and you participate in, in, uh, in the outperformance uh, and you don't have to uh, spend hours a day looking for the best of the best. Clovis, uh, yeah, so I, I can't, you know, does this look like a bubble? Does this look like a bubble? So for everyone says that the market is a bubble, uh, you need to look clearer. There are parts of the market that are certainly a bubble and they're coming down uh, meaningfully and quickly, but there are other parts that have been just in a depression and we can take advantage and go against the crowd, be patient. If it goes against us, buy more. And then eventually they rebound uh, like like banks and energy when we were buying in the middle of the pandemic and it's buying from some serious people that were puking it out um, or employees of serious people that were puking it out. And uh, it's been a home run. So um, more here. So, look, I, I, I'm showing I'm not going to go through all 20 pages, but, you know, that that's the point. Larry Culp posted an open letter on LinkedIn. He's talking to investors. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity in industrials, guys. It, it might be a little muddy until they break it up, but, um, uh, you know, they're breaking it up into healthcare, commercial, aerospace, and to power generation. Guess which one he's going with? The one that I've been pounding the table on, commercial aerospace, um, you know, which is why we like Boeing. I think that's that's also an enormous opportunity. Boeing, we got tremendous news that we said was coming. It finally came. Uh, this is not it. This this is just showing that Boeing won its annual jet order race on an adjusted basis against Airbus. Uh, that came out this week. That that boosted the stock. Uh, let's just take a look at what Boeing's been doing so you can visualize it. Um, that was Cigna. This is Boeing. These are names that we were pounding the table on, guys. Uh, from 186 to 226 since uh in less than a month in three weeks so i i think this is also going to work high higher into the 300s this year um okay so boeing ah here was the big news that came that came out yesterday morning before the opening 
So they got the plan for recertification in December. Remember the stock bounced on that. Now the management came out and said uh, shares jumped higher amid the reports that the Planemaker 737 MAX jet could return to service in China later this month. So in the month of January, that is huge, huge news. And if that tr proves to be finally true, uh, then stock is going to continue to power higher just as it has been from 186 to uh, 226 in the last three weeks. So um, we, we love that news. We said it was coming and here it is. I mean, it's just all the, all the chips are falling into place. Very exciting time. So uh, this is big news also as it relates to inflation and no one's really focused on that. So yesterday, was it yesterday? No, January 13th. So yeah, yesterday. Um, so on Wednesday, the Supreme Court blocked uh, President Biden's vaccine mandate for large companies. And uh, GE today came out and said, well, if, this, if, the, if it's not being upheld by the uh, Supreme Court, we're dropping it. So there's no longer a vaccine mandate at GE. I think many other companies are going to follow suit. And the implication for that is that I believe there's going to be an enormous supply of labor that comes back into the market. You know, there's 30% of the population that are unvaccinated, uh, and we've got a 68% um labor force participation rate i think you could see that tick up to 70 71 percent over the next year uh as more and more companies relinquish uh any type of uh vaccine mandates i think people are going to just say it's time to go back because you know the 30 percent that are not vaccinated if they're not vaccinated by now they're never going to be vaccinated and it's likely that if they didn't catch omicron they will have you know they'll they'll have caught it by the end of the month uh, and they'll have a worse situation than the people who are fully vaccinated and boosted. The vaccinated and boosted people, you know, have a cold for a day or two and they're fine. They'll probably have more like a COVID experience, you know, a week. Uh, and then they bounce back, provided they have no, no comorbidities. But, but the key is that uh, pretty much everyone's going to have some level of immuni immunization because uh, everyone will have had it. And then we move into the endemic phase where it's a seasonal flu. So the point of the, me bringing up this article is that um, with a with a big supply of labor coming back on in coming months, as more companies get rid of their vaccine requirements because the it, it didn't hold up, hold up in court, with the exception of healthcare workers, it did hold up. Um, if more supply comes on, then then employers won't have to pay as much money. So wages should stop going up as aggressively as they have been. And that's been a huge sticky component of the inflation numbers that we've been seeing, uh, which should also moderate. Again, I don't think it'll be evident prior to the March hike. Therefore, we should see a March hike, but it may slow down the pace at which they hike. And we wind up, might wind up with two or three hikes this year without quantitative tightening versus four to five plus quantitative tightening, which I think would be way too much, way too fast. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind. But this is this is really big news that, that I think kind of got overlooked this week. Um, so JP Morgan, you know, all the banks reported everyone was down except for Wells. JP Morgan beat earnings expectations, but the stock falls on higher expenses and slower trading. You know, last year, all these companies trading and investment banking, they, they got the benefit of the doubt. Uh, now that you're getting into the real business, which is the loans and uh, and and uh, the benef the interest rate sensitivity, Wells is the one raking it in. Wells Wells Fargo's quarterly profit soars 86 percent, banks revenue up 13 uh, percent, and you can read this in the Wall Street Journal and and just see how that all breaks down. But uh, Wells is now best in class. Everyone wants it. If you remember in 2020, it was the one that was down the most worst in class they don't have any banking or trading business uh and now everyone wants it so like we always say when everyone wants it help them out and we started to help them out uh uh after this good news and and that again doesn't say it doesn't go higher it just says we think we with a portion of those profits we think we can do make a higher return in the next 12 to 24 months now putting some money in biotech and, and China is starting to move on its own and we have fully uh, well enough exposure there. Uh, some sectors just looking at uh, some things actually getting oversold, materials, uh, the NASDAQ. Some of these tech stocks 
the bullish percentage down to 35. That's historically been like kind of a buying range. So some of these might start to bottom. Um, so I wouldn't just say like, oh, you have to be 100% in value now. Uh, nothing else will work because, you know, it looks like some of these things are getting oversold. And you be more selective. You buy more of the companies like the Intels that are earning money versus the, you know, Zooms that are, uh, you know, it's, it, there's just no way to value Zoom. I mean, I think Zoom's always going to be a thing. I think Zoom's an incredible product. But, you know, is, is 40 times sales the bottom? I, I don't even know what it's trading at now, but they're not making money. So it doesn't matter if it's trading at 20 times sales or 40 times sales. Uh, in my view, if, if they're not generating cash, I can't value it. So uh, unless it had been, unless it's an exogenous event, like we had the um, pandemic, and then I can see what its historic trend is and, you know, make a bet on what percentage of that trend will be recovered and in what time. And that's kind of what we did with the oil stocks and the bank stocks, et cetera. Um, so, but you are seeing infotech and some of these groups that are starting to look a little bit oversold now year to date performance energy is the top performer up 13.6 percent financials is number two at 5.5 percent industrials is number three uh that's been good oh excuse yeah industrials is number three the worst performers are real estate and tech which we talked about in december so um that's a big divergence between up you know 13% or down 5%, depending which portfolio you have, you could be up 20% year to date, you could be down 15, 20% already if you if you had too much tech and real estate. So uh, that dispersion is very positive. Okay, casinos, um, which we talked about with Lauren. So JP Morgan was out saying US casinos in Macau already seen the worst. They put this note out yesterday, by the way, it's kind of coincident with uh, getting the news this morning that the licenses were going to be approved. But nonetheless, they put it out. Uh, maybe better to be lucky than be good, but more likely, uh, you know, very, very good. So, uh, quote, we turn incrementally bullish on Macau SAR Gaming. Most investors seem hesitant to bottom fish, citing license risks. VI interesting they put that first. VIP fallout and uncertain travel policies as key concerns. These are all valid, but we think the level of concern is unnecessarily high. Uh, some may be concerned with, about a potential spillover impact, but history and our recent checks suggest demand for premium mass or even direct VIP remains unscathed from junket fallout, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We, we couldn't agree more. Uh, Macau reveals casino law changes. Las Vegas Sands win are soaring. Uh, this is really nice to see because, you know, uh, owning them in the last couple of months and they've done nothing and they're just weaker and weaker and it's just like these stocks are so cheap and you add and you add and now they're just ripping and it's just the beginning uh, for the longer term holders. Uh, US dollar, which we talked about last year, if you remember up here, we were saying, you know, our bet six to nine months is the dollar's lower versus higher. Everyone was talking about it going to new highs. It's starting to roll over a bit here. Uh, we'll see if that trend persists. But, but uh, you know, we told you the commercials had been selling. We don't never want to bet against the commercials. They're always early and they're always right uh, for the most part. And you can see similar trends in the past. Uh, so, you know, flat to down dollar is more likely than, uh, you know, super strong dollar, which everyone had been betting on in Q4. Article of the week, the last shall be first. Uh, so now we're going to cover... Uh, um, my appearance with uh, Liz last week uh, to get through some of the key themes for this week's uh, podcast. Um, so thanks to Liz and Ellie for having me on. My, in the segment, um, we discussed the Fed rate hike liftoff now likely uh, in March for three reasons. First off, the unemployment rate uh, was is down to 3.9%. Uh, it was 3.5% pre-pandemic. The number of unemployed people, I think, is 6.3 million versus 5.7 million pre-pandemic. So that's close enough for government work. Uh, the average hourly earnings were up 4.7% versus 4.2% expectations in the jobs report this month, last week. And the labor force participation rate ticked up to 61.9. 61.9, uh, by the way, I think I said 68 earlier in the call. It's 61.9. I think that with this vaccine mandate over, you're going to get 30% of the population, even if you got 10% of that 30% that comes back 
uh, to work, that's going to bring that participation rate up to 63, 64. Uh, and you're going to see uh, wage increases slow down. That'll help inflation. I think it's it, it could create a Goldilocks scenario, but we probably don't recognize it until June. And by then one hike, maybe even two hikes will already be in. Um, these probabilities have gone up, but it looks like now 74 plus 4, so about 80% uh, probability in Fed funds futures of a March rate hike. Now, where to invest? This is the most important theme. We covered it a bit last week, but we want to reemphasize it because it's playing out as anticipated uh, and uh, it's something you can, a uh, skill you can take for the long term. Now, if you look at sector performance and asset class performance by year over the last two decades a clear pattern emerges laggards become leaders and leaders fall from grace every one to two years i said that on with on uh, the show with liz and um so let's just take um any sector let let's let's even follow here's a good one healthcare okay 2007 it was kind of middle of the pack 2008 it was top of the pack 2009 back to middle of the pack, 2010 bottom, lat, worst kit performer, 2011 near back up to the top, third third best performer, 2012 middle of the pack, 2013 top, 2014 not too much movement, so 2013 to 2015 it, it stayed up towards the top, 2016 it was the very worst performer and then it worked back up to the best performer by 18, near the worst performer by 19, middle of the pack, middle of the pack, uh, and so on. So, um, so this year, 2021, industrials were the third worst performer for last year. We think they're going to be in the top three this year. We like Boeing. We like GE. We like it Lockheed Martin. We've talked about all of them. They're starting to move in material ways in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, to the upside and then you had like energy real estate real estate is the worst performer this year in financials energy and financials are following through but we are selectively taking profits on financials and a little bit of energy here and there we do think these have a long-term tailwind but after moves like this uh, this is where you have to have discipline because now the crowd is coming in Ben Graham, even the intelligent investor is likely to need considerable willpower to keep from following the crowd. So uh, we still want exposure because we like them over the intermediate to longer term, but they've had such a monster mo uh, room. Bulls make money, bears make money, pigs get slaughtered, and we don't want to be too piggy. We want to harvest some of those and put them to work that in areas that even if they keep going up, there are areas that will go up a lot more. Uh, and we think biotech's one of them, obviously China, uh, we got well positioned in Q4, so um, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, asset class returns we also covered on Liz's show. Take a look at emerging markets. 2007, top. 2008, worst performer. 2009, best performer. By 2011, worst performer. By 2012, back up to the top three. By 2013, second worst performer. And on and on and on. By 2017, back up to the top. By 2018, worst performer. Uh, 2019 middle of the pack, 2020 back on top, 2021 worst performer. Our bet is it's going to be in the top three this year. China is the biggest weight, 30 to 40 percent of the index, and uh, and that's why we're exposed there. Uh, 2021 REITs were the best. They're starting out the worst this year. So that's the last shall be first. Um, uh, and then in the context of uh, talking to Liz about industrials and emerging markets for sector and for asset class. Our picks were Boeing, uh, which uh, which was timely given that they got the recertification announcement yesterday. Uh, and then uh, Alibaba, uh, I said controversial stock, but it's now up 20% off its recent lows. Now it's 24. Munger doubled down on his double down. You can buy cheaper than one of the best value investors in the world with a company that grew top line 29% last quarter despite the crackdown. Earnings and cash flow are up more than 500% since the IPO in 2014, and you could buy at 2014 prices in the past few weeks. Uh, so that's why we were in. Okay. Uh, what has happened so far this year? Well, we saw Alibaba. Okay, we've covered the sector performance. Uh, we've covered value versus growth. Um, now, you can see, we can see below that 
Not only do sectors and asset classes rotate on a year-to-year -year basis, but so do countries. So, uh, in terms of countries, Hong Kong was the second worst performer last year, only uh, exceeded by New Zealand. Um, and, and you can see over time how these countries just move up and down, just like we covered emerging markets. So, um, you know, you, you just see they go from worst here's the middle worst it was towards the top in 2018 it was at the top in 2017 middle of the pack uh hong kong that's where all the china tech are and you can just see so they go from worst to worst to first here they were bottom five here it was top four uh here it was at the top in 2007 and then it uh fell to towards the lower end in 2008 and it works the same way but buying when it's been this low odds favor that you're going to get a rotation back uh we also saw so the hang sang's up 4.4 seven percent at the time we wrote this article on wednesday night while the nasdaq was down three percent so last year everyone wanted u.s tech this year everyone wants chinese tech uh, emerging markets performance relative to the s p just broke out with the turn of the calendar year if you remember in december we said watch when the calendar turns managers will be willing to show this on their books and that's breaking out um okay for the general market you had uh ryan dietrich put out a couple charts talking about average midterm year drawdown in the presidential cycle is 17 percent the next 12 months is up 32 percent we both we believe both the downside and the upside will be more muted uh you know tend to you know, 10%, maybe a little more pullback uh, or two this year, uh, but we probably won't finish up, uh, you know, meaningfully double digits. I'd say high single digits, low double digits for the general indices, but under the surface, but people buying biotech, which doesn't have an enormous impact on the S&P, can make a ton of money. In our view, again, this is opinion, not advice. If it takes two years, so what? If you double your money, um, click here for terms. But... Um, and that's that. And then this is the seasonal election pattern from Stock Stock Traders Almanac. This is the second year of a new Democratic president, uh, and it shows you know a lot of weakness in the first uh, half of the year into the election. We'll see if that follows. I don't think it'll be as pronounced, but it's something to keep an eye on the, the tendencies, uh, just to to uh, be paying attention. Um, Earnings are the name of the game. The key is guidance. Look, I mean today, as bad as banks were down, excluding wells fargo which was up um by and large you're you're getting strong numbers i mean wells beat on both the top and bottom line jp morgan had its best year ever in 2021 despite being coming in a little light on the uh, top line because of trading and they're having to pay up to get talent um citigroup is a is a uh restructure is a um restructuring story they're they're just rebuilding the whole business they're selling off I saw they're selling off uh, their city branches in Mexico. I think they sold off some in Singapore this week. So they're they're trying to streamline the business, and they'll be a fine company as as they do that. And I, I think they're headed in the right direction. So that's early look on earnings. Um, the fear and greed is still neutral at 64. Uh, also, the National Association of Active Investment Managers that came out yesterday tipped back into the 70s. So they're not all in and they're not all out so they're, they're kind of neutral there as well um and i said if earnings are the name of the game interest rates will be the arbiter of the score it's not only what companies produce and how they guide moving forward but how much market participants will be willing to pay for those future cash flows in other words what is the multiple and and i think if you look back to that article we did about microsoft and compared to alibaba and how microsoft you know, grew earnings and cash flow over 100% from 2007 to 2013, and the stock did nothing. When it started its ascent, um, its multiple was 7.9, and I think it was, you know, 51 times when we got to that, um, when we wrote that article. And, and by the way, it's rolled over considerably since that article. Uh, and Bob has moved up, so maybe more people read my articles than, than we know. <laughs> or it's just... Uh, uh auspicious timing but um nonetheless uh this is where we are so the 10-year yield broke through hit 180 basis points 
gets pulled back. Um, the jury's still out. Let's see. I mean, our, our base case had been 2 to 225 in the first quarter. We'll see if we, we get that or if this is uh, uh, the peak uh, at taper like we saw in 2013, 2014. My guess is we do push a bit higher to 2, but at 2, 2.25, I'd be a buyer of bonds. I got to be honest with you. Uh, I think that's going to represent an enormous opportunity. But I don't think we're there yet. I think this does push a bit higher with all the hawkish speaking. And I think we're going to see more hawkish speaking in January, which is why maybe in February we see uh, uh, see some more volatility. Um, economic data quickly. Um, wholesale inventories. It's not terribly important. Okay, the C CPI and came in line with expectations, but obviously the highest since 1982. We covered inflation. We did, had another big crude draw, 4.5 million barrels. I think energy was up. WTI was probably mid-80s today, 83, 84, somewhere in that range on Russia fears. Phil covered it on the uh, claim and countdown. Go ahead and check out that segment to listen to Phil's comments on energy, which are brilliant as always. And um, and then you've got continuing claims were very good. The initial jobless claims were worse than expected, 230,000. But that's that number is less important to me than the continuing, which which looked very healthy. Uh, and then the wholesale prices, uh, PPI up 9.7, highest since uh, 2010. But we covered all the reasons and, and why we think that that'll start to work itself out. Uh, retail sales were weaker. We covered that consumer confidence, why that was. And uh, and that's the story. What's going on with the rig count? Did we get a rig count today? Uh, yeah, so the rig count uh, jumped up a little bit. Uh, 11, 11 rigs is that uh, total rig count was up uh, 13 rigs. So there's some supply starting to come on the market. So all these bullish bets for $100 oil, maybe they'll get a little, maybe they'll get a taste of it. But uh, I'd be inclined to say we're going to see some supply come on at these prices from somewhere, uh, people are going to want to hit this bid, especially with uh, recency bias for having dealt with negative oil prices two years ago. Anyone that has oil is going to want to hit this bid and and uh, and be selling into it. So uh, if you do see 100, which I, I, I personally wouldn't bet on, but let's just say you do with the demand coming back uh, after Omicron, uh, I think it'll be temporary. That, that that demand, the Saudis will either say, "Hey, we've got an idea," <laughs> or or the U.S. producers will start, you know, ramping up and um, uncovering some of the ducks and 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 getting the oil out to market. So that's the story for this week. I hope you found it helpful. Covered a lot of new ideas, but I think the key theme, whether it's countries, sectors, or a asset classes, last shall be first. We're positioned in that regard. We had a new theme with biotech. Uh, did it bottom this week? I have no idea. I, you know, maybe it'll go lower. We'll add more. Uh, but I think on a risk reward basis, I think that's an unloved sector with a lot of opportunity. Uh, take some time and go through them on your own. And with that said, we'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Uh, make it a great one. Bye for now.